We have Jennifer in the building. Um, my name is Jesus Azteca, 500 Sanchez. I am your host of the 500 and Growing podcast. Jennifer is somebody that I've known for a really, really long time. I met Demetrio. I met Randy, which were people that were part of the Filipino community. I was doing emceeing and poetry, and uh, there was a space that was always welcoming to being culturally aware. Funny story, mm. I went to your wedding. Yeah. And I had <laughs> no idea yeah. that what? y'all wore guayaberas. Yeah, so okay, gotcha. My dumb ass went with a suit. Oh. Man, I was frying <laughs> that know, day. I was out frying. Yeah. Frying. Like, yeah, yeah. Man, I was I was sweating. Like I went I came home and my I, I man, I was just in a bad situation. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw everybody in their nice guy. And I was like, yo, I could have worn a guy. I that too, man. But anyway, it was a, a beautiful experience. And, and you know, I've, I've known Jen and, you know, Michael, her husband, and they've always been really, really positive. Jennifer became a nurse and then left nursing and started a business and consulting and does coaching work uh, in a sense. But she'll explain a little bit more what she's doing uh, currently. But there have been several paths mm. that uh, Jen has gone through in her life. And, you know, uh, I'm really interested in talking with her and kind of processing all of these paths. So everybody, uh, let's give a big round of applause to Jennifer Asidao Gerwin. Uh, Jen, what was your childhood like? Where did you grow up in Chicago and, and what was it like? Mm hmm. So I grew up north side, right around the Belmont and Clark area. We all lived in this in the high rise before everyone like moved out to the suburbs and all the aunties and, you know, cousins and uncles were on different floors of the high rise. And my grandmother, God bless her soul, like she was like the underground <laughs> like daycare center okay. for the building. Nice. And through word of mouth, you know, people would just drop off their babies in her apartment yeah. and she would take care of everyone. And she was just amazing. And a hustler though, too, because if, yes. if she's doing that, like, yes, she yes. had her business. Oh, yes. She was official. Yes, yes. Because they're yes. not just dropping them off for free. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And my, my grandma is so cool because she's like, oh, no, 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 no. Like she would, you know. Like, like, no, take it, take it, take it. Like the, the money. Yeah. You just say, no, no, no. And then she would take it, of course. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah, what yeah, I mean? Yeah. yeah. And she was really good at what she did, what she did too. Like she just knew how to hold everyone down and yeah, give really good care, feed everybody. But she was a disciplinarian too. Oh, okay. Oh yeah. Did you suffer that discipline? A little bit. Like, like, <laughs> um, my mom and I, my mom, my dad and I, we laugh about this. Like it, when we were sleeping over, she would line us all up. Uh -huh. And she's like, close your eyes. She would say dikit, meaning like close your eyes really tight. And if you just peek like that and she caught you, bam, like she would hit you. Ooh. <laughs> Damn, you <laughs> so better keep your eyes you closed. You gotta keep your eyes closed. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. But she had so much love. My my grandmother has so much love. Yeah. What was Belmont and Clark like? I, I mean, I know Bel Belmont and Clark because I remember there was an army surplus store there, yep. but that was in the 2000s, right? Like yeah. around that era. That I used to buy my combat boots there, yeah. Man, I used to buy all the, the nunchucks. It was like, you know, it's like inner city. I would say it's equivalent to, I don't know if you, yeah, it's equivalent to um, Uptown, I would say. The vibe. Okay. Yeah, like when Uptown, I remember when I was, oh my God, I remember back in the day, I remember visiting a friend and this dude like as i passed by he put like his something like on my head like he just went like this uh -huh. and i just i just kept on walking you think it was a gun i don't know i don't know okay i don't know he pointed something at my head like i just i just kept on going so i've had situations like that where you know i i lived on the boulevard and i lived between two gangs mm on the on the borderline between two gangs and so i was coming home late 
two guys came up to me and one had a gun, put it to my head like that oh. and was like, yo, say some killer. Right. Damn. And so I was just like, nah, I'm not really trying to say that right now. And then by the end of the conversation, I was screaming at him. I was mm -hmm. just like, I can't believe that this is happening, man. Like, this is what we're, you know, we're trying to stop. We're trying to stop us from killing each other. And you're over mm -hmm. here pointing guns at people. And I was screaming at him. Mm -hmm. And that's why, why they they left. Mm -hmm. And while they were leaving, I was screaming at them to the top of my lungs. Like, y'all are stupid. Like, mm -hmm. not very smart. Not very smart on my part. Um, because it would have, it, it put me in a, a really weird situation. And I'm glad that some force made them walk away. You yeah, know? yeah. Maybe in, in that same respect, like something made you just keep walking. Yep. I think that mm. you keeping on walking is like um, you don't know the universe just aligned. And I've been protected like several times in my life. And um, I remember visiting a friend and he lived in this, this high rise building. And um, I accidentally got off the wrong floor. And I, I started knocking at the exact same unit, but the one below him, right? And this is what happened. Like, I was about to knock, and something kept my hand yeah. from doing it. And I'm like, this is weird. Like, yeah. And I'm like, and then I realized, oh, I'm on the wrong floor. So I go back to the elevator. I go up one floor, knock on the right door, and my, my friend who's perturbed like, opens the door and he's just and i'm like what's wrong and he goes man the, the most fucked up thing happened to me the dude downstairs from me came up earlier that day and started stabbing his door with a knife oh shit yeah and i'm like what yeah. <laughs> and i was about to knock on this guy's door but something prevented me yeah. from doing it so yeah it's interesting we were talking about what it was like to grow up in that area. Were there a lot of Filipinos in that in that space? No, it was very diverse. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, in our building, I remember like one of my best friends was African American. You know, um, yeah. One thing that you talked about in past conversations was that uh, your parents came from the Philippines. Yeah, and they were right. they were really socially active in the Philippines. They were part of the the social movement there, mm -hmm. and. Um, and what was that like? And then imagine going from that for them and then going to this diverse space. Mm -hmm. That had to have been a trip it for them. It was tough. Too. It so, was yeah. tough for my dad. Like, I I just had a conversation about it with him recently. And because um, he worked for the CTA. Oh, did the, he? Yeah. Yeah. He, okay. he And he retired from it. But his level of consciousness is pretty... Like, he's a thinker. Mm -hmm. He's a blue-collar man. And he's read, like, every philosophy you could think of. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in that high school, in that household. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have typical, like, conversations. Like, and even, like, everything from, like, spirituality to, to politics. Um, it was just all open for us. Yeah. And uh, my dad, I consider my dad as my first mentor. Okay. And he mentored me in in, in organizations and and dynamics and organizations and he prepared me like really early on how to handle things mm -hmm. so um and we are like we're so close right now we're so close do you have any brothers or sisters i got a younger sister okay yeah so you only have an, a younger sister That's so you're it, the older yeah. sister i'm the older sister okay yeah so kind of like my situation i have two girls Oh, and wow. so it's just like, yeah, so I can imagine like the knowledge that he's trying to transmit to you. Yeah, I'm closer to my dad than like compared to my sister to my dad. Uh -huh. It was really tough for my parents to raise, you know, kids and then be politically active. And at one point when we visited the Philippines, my mom decided to leave my sister there. Mm. And uh, for like a year, I think she just to, like kind of like hope with everything and my sister comes back after a year and she speaks my mom's dialect in the Philippines, which my dad doesn't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so like my dad's carrying his baby and, you know, who's, who's like speaking this language that he can't understand. Mm -hmm. And then I don't understand it either. My mom's the only one that understands it. Right. Mm -hmm. Cause there's like, there's like hundreds of dialects in the Philippines. Right. Mm -hmm. And my mom's from a different Island from my dad. And I'm just like born and raised in America. So I'm like pointing at all these different items and just teaching her English. Mm -hmm. And that's how she learned English. Wow. Yeah. You were raised by an organizer of the movement yep. in the Philippines. Yeah. 
and and then here in the the United States, what was that like? It created like a feeling of abandonment, you know. So, and you know, having women friends, my peers, and they were having children. Like I would advise them to really be careful of that because I grew up in that. You know, and they're raising children. And I was also exposed to like kind of really traumatic material Mm -hmm. because, um, and I'm telling you like friends of the family, you know, who were survivors of torture Mm -hmm. and I would speak to them and I knew their experience, you know? So the reality was very real for me in terms of like, you know, what, what political repression looked like and what that's about. And like seeing images and just knowing the reality of, um, a dictatorship mm-hmm. was terrifying for me as a child. So, Man. yeah. It had to have been incredible to have those parents. It is a, it's a real duality. I mean, it's like, um, so what was, okay, let me, this is what's coming to my mind. This is like, I want to share this with you. So I went to a Catholic school. We lived across the street from the Catholic school that I attended. Mm-hmm. And, um, some some memories are coming to me right now where I'm telling like I'm in the car and dad's driving and I'm like dad I just learned about Adam and Eve and we all come from Adam and Eve and blah 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 right yeah. and this is my dad they're brainwashing you <laughs> nice <laughs> and I'm, but I'm shocked because listen it's it's the word of the bible or whatnot and yeah. as a kid you're so impressionable right like Literally, our brain waves are like alpha, theta, whatever you say is yeah. is going to be our programming, right? So, yeah. but my dad's like disrupting it like immediately. Yeah. And that's what I grew up with. Yeah. I grew up with my dad like questioning everything. Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like, you. I feel him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, dude. And he would challenge me a lot. Yeah. He would challenge me. That's why like one thing I could say about my my superpower at this time is I can like embrace complexity like nothing. Like yeah. I will I will look at things from many different angles. Yeah. And actually Mike is like that for me too, my husband. Yeah. Like he'll challenge me and be like, ah, you know. Um and that's like my experience with males, to tell you honestly. It's like I can train with them, I'll match their energy, you yeah. know. You know what I mean? Like now, females on a on a it's a different thing for me. Like yeah. being betrayed being betrayed by females has was my experience yeah. in my past, and I've had to like heal that too. So yeah, yeah, um, it was challenging. It was definitely challenging. But I'll say that my dad like is super cerebral. He helped me mold my critical thinking, and my mom is very spiritual, mm-hmm. and she was also a woman that suffered silently in her marriage. Mm-hmm. Right. So, um. And my, and my mom, you know, she just, uh, she acknowledged that my, my father just wasn't, it's different now, by the way. No, but yeah, my, sure. my father. We just, all grow, right? Yeah, yeah. We all grow, right? My father just wasn't present. Mm-hmm. Just, he, he was just checked out a lot because I think it's just being an immigrant male, mm-hmm. you know, and, and the pressures of that and then the political movement, the pressures of that. And, you know, when my mom, like, um, became a citizen, they showed her her FBI file. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. They knew all about them. Yeah. What was it like to not have your dad there then? Actually, my father and I had more of a comrade relationship. Mm -hmm. So we had, like, a working relationship. And... um, but like, actually, okay. Oh, I would like go with him to travel to different cities for meetings, right? Mm-hmm. And I just have this this beautiful um, memory of being on a train. Mm-hmm. And you know how there are different carriages. You mm-hmm. open up the carriage, you go to the next one. I thought we we're gonna fall off the train when you open up that that uh, that door. Yeah. And I'm like, where are we going? And I remember, because I was... Yo, really, you about to jump out yeah. there? Like, <laughs> I'm like, not trying to jump yeah, out there, right. yo. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh my God, we're going to die. <laughs> so he, and we, he brought me to um, to the the carriage where you eat. And I'm like, we're in a freaking like train where you just sit down and eat. It was like the dining carriage or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, and he orders cheesecake. And I'm like, 
they make a cake out of cheese. I mean, this is like my thought process, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. What we're trying to say is like, actually, like, even he wasn't like, you know, the most doting father or anything like that. But I have like amazing memories of my dad, mm -hmm. you know, and um, yeah, yeah. So it wasn't, um, I didn't feel like he was absent, but he definitely wasn't really emotionally available and and also to my mom yeah. and that's why my mom like suffered you know silently and and to tell you frankly like just you know doing mindset work and my love my expertise now i i realized that i recreated the same dynamic in my marriage mm. well those are vicious cycles right like yeah, they're yeah. cycles they're, they're, it's learned behavior it is and so you you don't know that you're programmed or like your exactly. subconscious yep. is is doing it yeah and so it's like Exactly. The journey of like knowing once you know that it comes from there, yeah. then you're able to work on it. Yeah. It's hard to work on it though, because you have to consistently coach yourself through situations. Cause yeah. it's just like your automatic reaction mm. might be to do what your dad was doing. Right. Exactly. Totally. Exactly. Um, I think that created like an avoidant, personality in a relationship and it wasn't just dad but it was also like ha having my heart broken with like former partners too and that was a whole dynamic when i got involved with mike right oh for sure yeah and having to heal those wounds and stuff like that so it's a lot of layers a lot of layers that we that we live w growing up did you was there anything that you wanted to change growing up Wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. I <laughs> I mean, I'm grateful for all my experiences, but I think growing up, I wish that I would have just literally sat down and just wrote, this is what I want in my life. Mm -hmm. And like, go there and decide. Like when I was in the Philippines, I was traveling i was like at the protest actions i was with the kasamas right and i heard that it was very typical for activists to go through this like you feel like you're at a very extreme crossroads crossroads in your life whether you're going to stay and just be full-time and you're just going to dedicate your whole life or you're not mm -hmm. and i was really feeling it when i was out there like in the countryside and you know, with the peasants and stuff like that. And uh, like, it was like a real, like deep, deep, like I just knew like that decision was going to set the rest of my life. I remember like being in a tricycle and I just made my decision. I'm like in a tricycle, there's a, there's a Kasama to accompany me. And I heard a voice and the voice said, it doesn't have to be this way. Like what you saw? Yeah. Okay. What I saw. It doesn't have to be this way. Um, you know, I was exposed to a lot of things, like the other side of the movement. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that voice I heard later on in my, in my journey was actually my spirit guide talking to me. Mm -hmm. And... When I came back, you know, I was like, nope, I'm going back to the Philippines. I'm going to be full time. I'm going to be, you know, I was, um, I thought I was going to come here only temporarily. Mm -hmm. And then my dad, he just mentioned to me out of the blue, he's like, I think you should meet this woman. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a consultation with her and, and, um, and I did. And the stuff that was revealed to me was just, and what was revealed to my mom was just like, no one could have known that stuff, right? So like, so my uncle that was killed because uh, he was an activist, he came through mm -hmm. and um, he communicated through this woman and and uh, her name is Joan and, and Joan was also like picking up on like dynamics with my, my mom's like, you know, family dynamic, you know, in the Philippines and like she would have never known that type of stuff. And at one point, this is a part of my journey, I asked her, I'm like, why, why was I born Filipino? Mm. 
Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Because here's what I noticed. I noticed that like I gravitated towards the movement, right? And like it was like my like I'm like a duck to water in a way, right? Yeah, because I mean you were raised in it, like Yeah, yeah. I was raised in it, that's true. Now, this is what's interesting. So I asked her, why was I born Filipino? And then one day she calls me up. She goes, hey, I got your answer. Come over. And she actually typed it up for me. Like, I I think I have it, like, stored somewhere. Mm -hmm. And the message I received was, you were a political leader in a previous lifetime. Mm -hmm. She doesn't know anything about me, by the way. Like, she just met me. You, and she doesn't even know I'm like politically active. She goes, you're a political leader in a, in a previous lifetime. And you were murdered by the masses because you were too far ahead of your time. Damn. And it answered a lot. Joe, you were Jesus. No, 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 no. No, no. I'm just messing no. up. <laughs> <laughs> just like he was. No, no, no. no. <laughs> That's so interesting. That like, that just, and I, and I understood like, and I don't know if this is part of like your belief system, but I... Um, my part of my belief system is we have lived before and there, there is such thing as reincarnation, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the reason why we keep on coming back is because we keep on learning our lessons. Mm -hmm. So I just, because in my subconscious mind somewhere, like the memory of being a political leader, like I was reliving it in this lifetime, but somewhere in my soul, that's why I was getting bored because I've done it already. Like mm -hmm. I've learned what I need to learn Mm -hmm. And it's time to, to move on. And that's where I almost feel like my journey really began mm -hmm. for my life, like starting in 2000. And that's when we One. met. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the Hamlin house. Yeah, yeah. So when did you buy the Hamlin house? Actually, we bought it around 2003. Okay, I thought it was earlier than that. But no, yeah. no, 2003 and, um, 2003 and we got married in 2005. So we bought the property first before we even got married. No, I remember. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, oh yeah, because you're at our wedding. <laughs> yo, we were having this. We were having this story. I didn't know that Filipinos wear guayaveras that are see through. Mm -hmm. They're very beautiful. You kind of see the undershirt underneath, unless somebody doesn't wear the undershirt. Right. But I went. I didn't know. I I never gone to a Filipino wedding, so uh, I went with a with a suit and a tie <laughs> and I got there and it was an outdoor wedding. So I was sweating the whole time. I was, I was having a hard time. I was drinking a lot of water that day, but yeah. So if, if the audience ever goes to a Filipino wedding and you are Latino and you have guayaveras at your house, mm -hmm. wear the guayavera. <laughs> it might not be as nice as the ones that the Filipinos are wearing, but you'll be cool. You won't be, uh, in a bad situation like I was, <laughs> <laughs> but I still had fun and it was a beautiful, it was a beautiful ceremony. I remember Chris yeah, doing yeah. the, the, the Kali yeah. and uh, yeah. This is interesting too. Um, <laughs> Mike and I, so we met on a plane ride. Do you know our story? I know. We, yeah. We met on a plane ride. This is kind of really funky. I prayed to God because I was at my wit's end, man. I was like, you know what? I really want to meet someone that would truly love me. Uh -huh. And that I would learn the most from. Okay, That's what I asked for. And so here comes my girlfriend calling me. I know immediately there's something very wrong. Because her sister ran away and contacted her while she was in New York City. So my girlfriend's contacting me, asking me to go with her to New York City. To go get her sister. To go get her sister. And I'm, I'm like workaholic. I'm this workaholic, right? That's my, that's my trauma response. That's my coping mechanism. No, I could tell, man, like you're, you're intense. When you get into something, oh, you're intense. Oh, you can feel that, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm like, no, I'm too busy. And it was my mom that was like, Jen, you're young, you're 19, like just go fun right so i'm like okay i'll go and on the way back there was a connecting flight from new york to ohio ohio to chicago and it was so packed that my girlfriend and i couldn't even sit next to each other so we had to choose our seats mm -hmm. so i choose my seat she, she chooses her seat and when we arrive in ohio like 
three fourths of the plane empties out. All these people start flooding in, and I see Mike walking right, mm-hmm. like on a, and I knew he was from the suburbs just by the way he walked. <laughs> I could I tell. I could <laughs> be like, "You look like you're about to go to a corporate meeting." <laughs> <laughs> I was like, and I thought he was like Samoan or something. I'm yeah. like, is he Samoan? I could see. I could see that. Yeah. Right. I'm like, wow, he's really good looking, but what am I going to do, right? So, and then I, so I close my eyes because like New York, we didn't sleep. And uh, I hear a man say, excuse me, can I get to get into my seat? And it's, it's freaking him. And I'm like, what? Uh-huh. So I wind up meeting my future husband. I didn't know on a freaking plane, on a plane ride. Wow. Sitting right next to each other. And, um, and again, that was all orchestrated by the universe too, by, by God. No, yeah. for sure, man. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it, we're, we're it, what you mentioned before resonated with me. Mm-hmm. Like, I believe that we're here to learn, yeah, as yeah. much as we can. Yeah, I try to stay open and have my ears open to everything. There are things that I'm trying to work through as far as like who I am as a person, character defects that I may have, but um, I'm aware of them now, mm-hmm. and I accept myself for who I am. But I also leave myself open for, um what life has to teach me the most hardest lesson that you may have is going to make you stronger and is going to propel you to what you need to learn in this lifetime. I don't want to skip over the, the Hamlin house experience. Right. And so the Hamlin house was a really cool place. It was in Albany park. Uh, it was like a three flat or a two flat, two flat, a two flat. And, and, um, there was a backyard and the backyard always had something popping. So it, it, there was poetry. There was like a, a Kali, which is a Filipino martial arts with the two bamboo sticks that are representative of machetes. There, and that's how I met Jesse, which is one of the past guests of the 500 and growing podcast. Um, and, um, you know, there was also a cultural night of resistance, which was a, a night where all these performers got together and were really like talking about real history, indigenous history that isn't necessarily taught or isn't necessarily spread in, in, in a place like the United States of America, right. That wants to spread their own messages and has their own biases in, in, in the way that they present history. And so Hamlin house, what was that experience like? What was K&R and mm-hmm. what was that time like? So we bought this property together and we started rehabbing it, which was a whole nother like dynamic in and of itself. When we bought the property, there were already tenants and then tenants moved out and we're like, you know what? Um, I think who started the trend was Demetrio. (laughs) He was looking for a place to stay and he moved upstairs. And then Matilda from New York city, like, she would come through Chicago and we would just, you know, hang out. Yeah. And then she's like, I love this city because New York was a little bit too much for her. Okay. And she's like, I'm like, Hey, I didn't know Matilda was from New York. Yeah. Matilda's from New York. And, um, okay. and she, I'm like, well, you can stay upstairs if you want, you know, and just be D's uh, roommate. I think they made the, what do you call it? The arrangements. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So that's how that's, that's, that, that's how it started. And then like people would just come through all the time. We would have meetings that's how it, that's how it started so and it was um there was a lot of powerful stuff going on there that was that was like developing other people i i went there and i got developed in that space totally i i think like i remember with all of the interpersonal stuff going on with the group like it was really intense and mm-hmm. i remember just saying a prayer for everybody that I was just wishing the best for everyone, you know? Um, we, I mean, we're all broken people. Yep. And yep. we all come broken. Yep. And sometimes we cut each other with yeah, the shards that we have. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's why we grew so much, right, from the experience. And in, in kind of like an esoteric terminology, like that's the karma that we all have to experience together. And somehow before we were all born, we agreed that we're going to give each other these lessons. What was K&R? Uh, I remember 
you know, we created like a youth sector. That's what I remember. And um, you're, you're, you're also working with different levels of understanding, right? So I remember like being at a meeting was really late and we were thinking of having this event just to bring the youth together. But like, how do we, how do we pull it off? Because we're like on this part of the spectrum and then everyone's like on another part of the spectrum in terms of like political understanding and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was, it was um, around Independence Day on June 12th. Right. So Mm -hmm. it was always about just intuition and creativity. And then I, I remember looking at a list of our, like our allies and like the subjects that they want to talk about. And then I, I remember I started like, oh, well, this this one is talking about, you know, like trying to lighten the skin all the time, right? Because that's that's a cultural phenomenon, like colorism. Oh, like, for sure. Film, right? and, like everywhere, right? And then there's, um, I, I just remember like tying the, 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 tying the themes together, like mm-hmm. cohesively. And then, hey, why don't we call it Culture Night of Resistance? Mm. And then to... But the, the themes had to be progressive. That's the thing, mm-hmm. you know. So um, then we went to the local restaurant. They happened to have, you know, like a place where you can have a party. Mm-hmm. And we're like, hey, can we have like an event here? And we'll, you know, drive people to your local, you know, to your restaurant for business. Yeah, they, 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 and they're like, uh, sure, you know. So, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. we'll, we'll get more business. Yeah, exactly. Right. So there was like a mutually beneficial. And then. You know, you know, those who are like up on stage and they're performing, um, they can invite their families, mm-hmm. right? So it was just like this organic, like really creative event. The first one was so successful, people having so much fun. And we had it another time. And I remember the most powerful k and I just, oh my God. I remember we had it at the Agape House, that, which was next to UIC. It was associated with the UIC campus. Mm-hmm. And um, it was so hot, dude. Like, it was like ninety degrees in the building. There was no air conditioning, mm-hmm. but it the the performances were so compelling mm-hmm. that everyone stayed. Like, no one left. Mm-hmm. And at one point, we're like, "Hey, let's go across the street and get some Italian ice so we can all cool off." And everyone migrated there, and mm-hmm. everyone came back afterwards. Whoa, that's like, cool. like no one like left and yeah. dispersed because it was that powerful of the, the energy was so powerful. Yeah. And I think it was really new. It was really fresh for the community. At some point though, I felt like it was becoming too routine. Like it would, like the formula was set, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and then I was going through as my father was kind of going through an existential like identity crisis Mm -hmm. in the movement because I was really deep in the movement. I was um, consenting and I'm going to, I'm going to use this term conscientiously. I was consenting to the indoctrination Mm -hmm. at the same time. My dad was like, he's always, he's always been a very spiritual man Mm -hmm. and his soul was just being pulled in that direction. He just wanted to like drink and like, immerse himself with spiritual teachings and i think i could and i remember i i could see him like changing yeah you know like his call like when you had your daughters right Mm -hmm. it's like you just feel you're drawn right and that's really spirit that's that that's love Mm -hmm. that's drawing you in that direction it wasn't necessarily the cause anymore and that's what was happening to my father who's my mentor can you imagine so i'm like dad what's going on with Yo, we ready to go. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> what, what, what? You're responsible for all this, and I'm, I'm so down. Like, what's going on? And and then I remember he said, and this is what I love about my father. He said, I forgot exactly what he said at that moment, but I said we were talking about consequences. We were talking about positive and negatives, yeah. right? To every situation, decision we make. I go, well, is there anything negative about about pursuing a spiritual path? Uh-huh. And he goes. Let me think about that. He was like, yeah. he always was just willing to to explore. Like nothing was was like 
uh, what was the term? Um, taboo. Taboo. Mm-hmm. Nothing was taboo. Nothing. And um, I just saw my dad changing. And I think that, that that his kind of like deep searching, soul searching, like it rubbed off of me. So I wound up going to the Philippines for five months. Mm-hmm. And um, it was it was so tripped out because I remember through my dad's like spiritual exploration, like he meets a woman who's still here in Chicago, but originally from South Africa. Mm-hmm. And he's like, you sh- I think you should meet this woman. Um, she was like a medium. And I go, Oh, I remember when this happened because I had just come back from the Philippines, dude. So then let's talk about nursing. So you went into nursing. Yeah. You, you talked about your family being, propelled towards the medical field and just nursing in general well historically that's the relationship between america and the philippines Uh that's the relationship like there was always a relationship of needing to fill the the needs in in the labor force and specifically in the the medical profession like i think ever since like the world war one of the major world wars so a lot of the ticket to come here is going to be you know, the medical profession and going into nursing or being a doctor. You're raised by activists. Yeah. Uh, You have that activist bug. You go into like this place where like you're in the inner circle of the movement in the Philippines and probably here in the United States Mm -hmm. because everybody's connected. Mm -hmm. And then you decide to become a nurse. Yeah, I remember, this is so funny, I remember, like, I was working, like, 3 to 11 shift, and, like, one of the allies of the organizations we were working with, like, calls me while I'm on, the sh- while I'm working. Yeah. Like, Jennifer, I need, I need advice on this. And I'm, like, <laughs> like, I'm literally, like, in the middle of working my shift, and we're having, I think we had, like, an event coming up or something, like, an activity. Yeah. And he wanted to, like, run something by me. This yeah. wasn't, like, in, it wasn't one of the Kasamas, it was, like, a, one of the American you know, um, we could call, we would call them solidarity. That's what we said, like the solidarity. And I remember like, if I needed to be at a meeting or whatever, I would, I would just map out whoever I had to switch over to get me off that, that shift. Yeah. Cause those are like two different, completely different hats. Right. Yeah. Like intuitively I've done that with my life. Like that's how I left nursing. I just knew like, this isn't for me. You know, I was good at what I did. I was making pretty good money and um, definitely could survive. I mean, a lot, a lot of times, like, during, like, political meetings, like, I was, like, covering everybody. Like, I would just buy food for everyone and because I just want to provide for people all the time. Um, I feel like nursing cultivated, like, compassion in me because I think that when you're really angry and you want to change the world which I got to tell you about that. Um, it it must have balanced me out, actually. Yeah, I can it imagine. Really, it really balanced me Because we were out. talking about that, yeah, right? Like, yeah. people fight, 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 yeah, fight. Yeah, yeah, right, right. But and here so, I'm taking care of people, yeah. And so that's like another dynamic that yeah. some people are just fighting. That's all they do. That's all that they do. And and, and again, going back to um, to Joan, who's been like, she's a messenger, right? She's mm-hmm. a messenger. And... At one point, I was hanging out with her, and I remember she said, ooh, this really, ooh, I got, I got to tell you about this. She goes, uh, Jennifer, you can't change the world. Whoa. Uh, I was like, what? Like, you know, I was like pissed. She goes, I'm hearing it. I'm sorry. I'm just giving you the message. You can't change the world. And this one time, we we're all gearing up to go to Washington, D.C. for a massive protest, right? Mm-hmm. And I was having, like, these conversations with Mike. Like, Mike, what are you going to do? Because we weren't married at the time. I'm like, what if I end up in jail? Whatever, blah, blah, blah. And Mike kind of challenged me. He's like, well, if that's what you're going to keep on thinking on, you're going to manifest it. Like, he, he we, we weren't mm. even, like, keen on these types of, like, terminology or... But essentially, Mike was telling truth. He was, like, saying truth to me. Like, you know, if your mind keeps on fixating a certain thing, you're it's you know because the fear itself will attract the situation to you Mm -hmm. and so get this so i was hanging out with joan again 
this one evening and I'm just sitting next to her and she goes, Jennifer, be careful what you wish for. Mm. She just said it like, like, Yo, man, it must be a trip hanging out with her. Though. Yeah. <laughs> I know. She's like, be careful what you wish for. And I'm like, excuse me? And she's like... You're like, yo, I'm just trying to get some fries from McDonald's yeah, right now. Yo. <laughs> like, like, just, what yeah. the hell? I'm just eating my dinner. What are you talking about? <laughs> no, yeah, just... yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but seriously, it was like that. And like, it was almost like like the, the, the messages I needed to hear would come through. And I may not want to hear them, but I needed to hear them. And that's what kind of pivoted me towards not being assassinated again. You were told to that you weren't going to change the world. Yeah. How did you How did you deal with that? I mean, did you have ego in that? Oh yeah. Were you just like, sure. what you mean? Yeah, I'm not yeah. going to change the of world. Course, like, I was offended. My dad, my mom has been doing <laughs> yeah, this. Like, I really wrestled with a lot of it, you know, and. Um, all I can say is it happened gradually and you saw me not take leadership anymore in the movement. You mm -hmm. saw me, this is what happened. So my concern was if I step down, then, you know, what's going to happen, right? So I, I consult with my friend, with Joan again, and Joan goes, this is how she said it. She goes, there will be another king and there will be another queen. Sure enough, someone else is going to step up to the plate mm -hmm. and will be the head honcho, right? And that's what happened. So it was taken care of. It was all good. Yeah. And then I pursued more of what I felt my soul was calling me to do. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you, and I'm gracious to the Kasamas that kind of like gave me my space and just, you know, allowed me to just, do what I needed to do because they just saw that I was distancing myself more and more. Mm -hmm. um, but that was almost like an ego death that I went through. For sure. You know, and I was being born into something else, but I wasn't too sure what that was. So how did, how did you make that transition? I listened to the inner voice. I just listened to the inner voice. And what happened was, <laughs> this is up where it all started for me was, um, uh, I was wearing my scrubs. I was about to go to work. And then my girlfriend called me and she said, I got something to show you. I went over to her apartment and she showed me, it was a VHS at the time of like just presenting what an entrepreneurial life was. And I realized that that was me. Mm -hmm. And this thing that I was playing into and just kind of consenting to just really wasn't who I am. Yes. That was it. 100. And I'm like, but see, we don't even know, like it's so under the radar. We just know that a little bit on the subtle, subtle gut feeling, like something's not quite right, you know? And, um, but finally I was shown the model. I was shown the alternative, like, the parallel universe, so to speak. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Oh, so that's what that looks like. And that's where I really, really belong. And the other thing is that we're, t we're conditioned to not think about entrepreneurialism, and exactly. especially in the movement. Like, right. It's just like, everything's communal. Everything is like sacrifice, self sacrifice. And so, those two conflicting ideas. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And you know, it was the first one that kind of like was my father. He told you, he told me it's like, it's not what you think it is. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's, he was getting so much more aware of like how he had to really take care of money and finances to free up time. So you can really concentrate on what you want. Mm -hmm. And he started planting that seed in my head. At the time, I was resisting it, you know. And in hindsight, Jesus, like, I'm like, in the movement, like, I fucked up so much as a leader. Like, really, like. No, I did too. To, talk to anyone who knew me back then. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, that Jennifer. Like, yeah, sure. Like, when I intensely want to get something done, like, I would get it done but I wasn't a leader that could bring the best out of other people. Mm -hmm. 
I wasn't at all. I didn't have those skills. You know, now I do, but back then, mm -mm. I didn't have the maturity. My temperament was so way off, so way off. And it wasn't until, like, I started, like, um, developing spiritually that I started chilling out. No, yeah, this is, and I appreciate your vulnerability. How did you make that transition to uh, being an entrepreneur and doing the work that you do now? I mean, you kind of touched on it a little bit, mm -hmm. but, but, you know, you yeah. watched that video and mm -hmm. that changed your life. And you were like, yeah. oh, shit, yeah. I connect with this. Yeah, I connected with it. And then I dabbled into certain um, business models and I failed. And then one of my, this is really interesting. I was, I was looking at um, property with a, a friend who was a realtor. And it's kind of funny because as we're driving to look at these properties, she, she pitches something to me. And immediately I was like shutting it down. I don't, I wasn't interested. She goes, well, why don't you meet with my sister? You know, she's really successful and, and she's like, you know, whatever, et cetera, et cetera, doing this. Um, Probably felt like indoctrination and that's why you were shutting it down. Yeah. I felt like I, I was familiar with the network marketing model and I was just like, I wasn't interested in it at all. Mm -hmm. So and I could sense that that's what she was pitching. But the funny thing is that Mike was sitting in the back, right? Oh, okay. So she was right next to me. And then she goes. And Mike was feeling it. Well, Mike <laughs> was in the back. This is what happened, right? So I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, no. And then she goes, oh, she wants to treat you out to Filipino food. <laughs> right? Because we don't really cook that much, right? Uh. So Mike goes, let's go. So she goes, great. She gets on the phone. She goes, yeah, we'll be there by whatever time. And I'm like, oh, shit. So I remember like, you know, entering the restaurant and our friend goes first. And I'm like, Mike, we're going to say no to this. <laughs> like, this is not whatever. We're not buying this We're not buying share. anything. Right, exactly. And I, I swear, this is like so classic for me. It's like, I, I didn't want to go to New York and I, I wind up meeting Mike, right? Yeah. I didn't want to meet this woman. Yeah. And just the circumstances, like, it's almost like the universe goes, nope, you're going to go, sorry. Yeah. Right? That's what happens to me. Well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I met my first business mentor. She was Filipina. She was a nurse. And oh, she wow. was really successful in business. Wow. Like she made seven figures. And I'm like, what? Uh -huh. No pressure too. And she read me immediately. She knew I was a leader. Nice. That's it. She let me go. And I'm the one that came back crawling to her. Yeah. Because, you know, the product was good and blah, blah, blah. And that led me, that led me to understanding myself yeah. better. So what happened was she could read me. She's like, she just basically said, Jen, you got to work on yourself. Like my mindset just wasn't conducive to success, right? So I do. I started reading books. I started attending like seminars and stuff like that. And this is where it was like a huge blind spot was um, made conscious mm -hmm. to me. And that's when Mike said to me, hey, babe, I think it's really great. <laughs> like you're doing all this stuff and you're learning, but why aren't you actually applying it? That was it. So. Well, I mean, him being your partner and pushing you in that way, it's like she, he's giving you permission too to do it. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, that, I mean, that's a good place because if, if you're trying to do it on your own mm -hmm. and you're trying to convince your partner that you, this, is, <gasps> this is worthwhile. Right. This is, that's the perfect scenario for you to jump off. Right. Yeah. Because he's the one presenting you with the ledge. Yes. And he, well, he was showing that there was, there was a disconnect. And what was really interesting is, listen, I, you know, I could work full time and go to school full time. I'll get straight A's. I passed the boards immediately. I was in nursing, like at the age of 20, you know, as a professional. So when he presents to me, it's, it's something called the knowing doing gap. Mm -hmm. Later on, I would find out. I opened up my mouth and I thought I had like a comeback. And nothing came out of my mouth. Mm -hmm. It was like so shocking. Like I didn't even have a comeback. And then at that moment. For him saying. Yeah. Like. Why don't you practice it? Yeah. Why don't you practice it? Why aren't you actually doing what you're learning to do? And so. 
at that moment, what I realized, and this is all internal, I didn't even say it to Mike, I realized there was something about myself that I didn't understand yet. And that's when, again, I was serendipitously led to my mentor. And uh, he was one of the, the only people in personal development who really talked about, number one, spirituality. That was like totally my jam. Like I was really developing spiritually and talking about the mind. And then he just said one thing and he goes, your subconscious mind is really what determines the results that you have. That was it. Mm -hmm. And then I started understanding and I started training on, on it. And then I loved it so much that Mike was the one who said, um, he's like, you know, you love this so much. Like, why don't you become a consultant? And I'm like, yeah. And thank God I said, yes. Thank God, because I found what was really authentic to me. And then I learned Bob's modality. I saw the limitations with Bob's modality too. That was a big part of my journey. Mm -hmm. It's been five years. And, and I, I started to understand more about emotional intelligence, about traumas, because I was also attracting clients to me that had trauma. Mm -hmm. And his modality, it works, but it doesn't really get to the healing aspect that people need in order to really be effective in manifesting what they want. And I started learning different modalities about healing, something called energetics and all that stuff. So, and I feel like um, I'm in a place where I can truly help people in a very deep way. Mm -hmm. Let's put it that way. And how do you help people? Like, how do you consult them? Like, what do you consult? Yeah, so usually the, it, it starts off, number one, with really getting clear on what they want because that's that's a very loaded question for a lot of people. It's like, what the fuck do I want? What do I really want? And it's not what society tells you. Exactly. Because it's what society, you really, really want. Society drives you to yeah. certain things. Yeah, like everyone thinks like, oh, I want like a million dollars or I want Lamborghini or whatever. No, actually, it's not what you really want. <laughs> you know, maybe what you really want is... Um, to travel and that's it, you know, um, whatever it may be. Like my client earlier today, she just texted, oh, I really don't want to go here. I want to go here. Mm -hmm. This is what I truly want, you know. So that's the number one step. And then the second step is we look at patterns and then we, we really de deconstruct it because we're so in the habit of being who we are and how we react, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's a certain pattern. That's a certain personality, and then we start mapping out, well, what is that version of you that actually gets what they want? Because if you expect to be the same person getting a different result in life, mm -hmm. it's like... Yeah, you have to change something. You have to change your person. You have to change, yeah, these habits. Your essence. Yeah. It, and the it, habits too, yes. For the sure. habits, your personality, your person, your personality really. Cause that's, that's actually an energy signature, right? Like you're, you have, everyone has a certain vibe about them mm -hmm. and then you got to change your, your vibe. That's conducive to that frequency of what you want. Right. So, and that's it. So you're, that's you're guiding way. people for, to their higher, yeah, higher self. That's it. That's, that's it in a nutshell. Yeah. Okay. And then how and, do you go ahead? So when, but then the, the conditioning, right, will always kick in. And that's where I'm there to guide them when, like, if they're emotionally triggered, I give them the, the tools mm -hmm. on, how, on how to cope with that and, and what to do with, like, the old self that wants to stay comfortable, mm -hmm. even though it's miserable, but wants to stay comfortable, will, will want to, you know, influence the, the habits. I've come to realize that, like, for example, Right now, like I'm, I'm attracting and I always have people of color who have aspirations of accomplishing more. Mm -hmm. Yet the conditioning of the ancestry will hold them back. So... And the beautiful is with their transformation, they're going to give back. They will give back in a much greater way to their people. Mm -hmm. And that's what I realized that instead of fighting something that's outside, 
in order to transform society. What I've come to realize is another aspect of it is working purely internal. Mm -hmm. Because once an individual shifts, it makes waves in the family, in the community. Mm -hmm. That's how I've kind of pivoted in terms of doing social justice work in a sense, Mm -hmm. where it's very rooted in, in healing. You know, and creating a whole human being. There are parts of our personality that may not be on board with the plan. Mm -hmm. And that's what I went through. That's what I realized. And um, I was actually stuck. I was able to get myself unstuck with the knowing doing gap by reprogramming my subconscious mind. And then I found myself still like almost like at a low energy point and I didn't quite understand what it was no matter how many affirmations I did, Mm -hmm. no matter how much like I visualized, there was something deep inside my psyche that I could feel it like it was surfacing, it needed to be dealt with. And as I was not working like online, I came across a dude based in LA and he offered to do a meditation, like a complimentary guided meditation. And when I did it with this guy, I saw this really angry little girl. Like she had a shadow over her and I had no idea like why I was seeing it. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay. And it it was Was like you. Yeah, it was, it was me. It was a part of my personality that was, that needed healing. There was no judgment. This, this dude was like, okay, it is what it is. This is what you saw. This was revealed on my conscious level of thinking. So I continued to, to network and I come across this woman and immediately my body was telling me to work with her like my body right and our unconscious mind communicates through our our bodies through like that's why muscle testing is very effective and um she was talking about something called energy psychology and I I just jumped in I'm like I want to work with you you know with your modality and essentially it's about communicating with your unconscious mind through muscle testing and what um, is muscle testing muscle testing is like literally if you were to stand up straight and you say um unconscious mind tell me what you show me yes you'll either go backward or you're gonna go forward Mm -hmm. and then you double test it to make sure that that's the real answer, right? So that now, um, body, show me what is no. You're either going to go backward or forward. So when you muscle test, you have a higher intelligence that flows through you. And Bob taught this, that flows, that flows to you and through you. And you can communicate with it. Mm-hmm. So my very first session with this woman, she was doing muscle testing and... I kid you not, this is what I heard. I heard a voice say, finally, you're paying attention to me. And it was, a, and I didn't know this. I didn't know that when we have traumas, there, it's almost like when you have an injured part of your body, like it will, like if you have an infection, right? Like a boil, it's localized. And your body will try to, um compartmentalize it from the rest of your body it's the same thing with our personalities yeah your subconscious will lock it up so that it'll protect you from it exactly so there was a part of my personality that needed to be reintegrated back into me Mm -hmm. and that's where like when when um when clients say i don't know i'm just i just don't have motivation most likely it's a hidden part of their personality Mm -hmm. that's not on board with the journey that this person has consciously decided that they want. And there's a way to help reintegrate that personality. It's usually the, the, um, you can map it out by looking at what triggers a person. Mm -hmm. And if you can map out what triggers a person, what that emotion is, that emotion is associated with a certain wound Mm -hmm. from the past Oh, for sure. It's a trauma that you suffered. I mean, I, 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 what I'm hearing is that it's, it's a trauma that you suffer that you're, you know, the, the little girl or a little boy or a little person is inside of you that didn't feel certain things or 
was Didn't meant feel to safe. feel like that. Yeah. Is like yeah. always in your decision making without you knowing that it's in yeah. your decision making. Exactly. Your body is your mind is always protecting you yourself. Mm-hmm. So it's it's always protecting you and it protects you by locking certain things away so that you don't have to think about them. But it's always in the back of your mind and your decisions mm-hmm. so going through the process of like really dealing with those traumas that you haven't really dealt with. Yeah. That when you deal with, you'll actually be able to grow out of. Yeah. And you'll notice that the same things that used to trigger you don't trigger you anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. That's how you know that you're, you're more whole and your energy level completely changes too. And you feel more empowered versus the victim type of mentality and consciousness. Actually, what happened in my evolution with this work, um, I started doing my own processes Mm -hmm. and I had people quantum leap just through my own content. Mm -hmm. So I do plug people into, if it's the right fit, into like a more in-depth manifestation type curriculum. Mm -hmm. And then the energetics that I do just like supplements that's more of like book learning application Mm -hmm. but to get to the deeper parts of the of the person that's what i do okay work with them yeah all right well how how would people be able to reach out to you if they wanted to get in contact with you um they can email me Mm -hmm. yeah jen at reach your highest potential.com okay they could do that and then your website would be uh reach your highest potential.com Okay. We really appreciate you and and the time. So thank you very much for making it to the 500 and Growing Podcast. Jennifer Asidao Gerubin. Thank you. 500 and Growing. 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 Podcast. Dedicated to the underdog. Cause I see you. Working on your craft. Getting strong. Cause I see you. Ready to set it off and on. Cause I see you. Correcting all that is wrong. Cause I see you. Dedicated to your craft. Read and study the math. Making goals and taking a stand. Original so you trailblaze a path. In tune with your inner master plan. Master plan. Master plan. Visit 500andgrowing.com for more creative content. Thank you very much for listening to the 500 and Growing Podcast. Remember that we have incredible guests that have already featured in episodes in the past. So please go back into the archives and listen to their inspirational stories. And then remember that we have incredible guests lined up for the future. So please follow on Instagram at 500 and Growing Podcast. Remember to follow on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or any of the major podcast platforms. You can also check out 500andgrowing.com for more creative content. 500 and Growing Podcast.